this evening. My name is Jeroen Smit, and I will be your host for this program, a conversation with Marina Hertz as part of the Festival Forum on European Culture. This year, the festival theme is We the People. Together with guest speakers and our public, we explore whether a European people exists, and if so, who are they? We explore the theme in exhibitions, debates, film, theater, and interviews. European artists and thinkers and their rich imagination take the center stage. I'm here in the Forum's studio, located in the Salon in the Bali in Amsterdam, and I'd like to welcome everyone watching online, wherever you are. In his address to the nation under lockdown last April, our king, the Dutch king, Willem, William Alexander of the Netherlands, mentioned the loneliness virus as a major cause of concern. And if there's one thing we have learned over the past few months, it is that many of us are very able to be simultaneously hyper-connected and lonelier than ever. With us here to diagnose this strange situation is British economist, academic journalist, Norina Hertz. For years now, she's a leading thinker in predicting global trends. And she just presented an intriguing book, The Lonely Century. And it will be translated, it will be presented in Dutch, I think next week or two weeks from now, uh, the Einzame, uh, yeah, the Einzame Eeuw. Of, yeah, no, we moeten even afwachten. We'll, we'll have to see that. The message is very clear. Never before we were so lonely, so disconnected. The lack of togetherness, feeling responsible for society, is threatening the future of democracy in Europe. That's the question. Well, we'll first listen now to Norina Hurt. She prepared a presentation, and then we'll be live discussing with her uh, her journey and her book. <laughs> I am waiting, seated at the window, my back against the pretty in pink wall. My WhatsApp pings. It's my friend, she's running a few minutes late. No worries, I message back. Cool choice of place. And it is. The gazelle-like clientele with their fashion model portfolios under their arms makes clear just how cool Chacha Macha in Manhattan's NoHo is. A few beats later, Brittany enters. Long-limbed, long-haired, her smile widens as scanning the room I come into her gaze. Hey, you look beautiful, she says. At $40 an hour, I'd expect no less. For Brittany is the friend I have rented from Rent-A-Friend, a website with over 600,000 platonic friends for hire. It's a sign of our times that today I can buy companionship as easily as I can buy cornflakes with just a few taps on my phone. But being able to rent a friend by the hour is just one curious indicator of how many people are now feeling a powerful absence of connection and community. For this is the lonely century, the loneliest century we have known. Four in 10 under 25s say that they often or always feel lonely. Two in five pensioners admit that their main form of company is their television or pet. Almost half of those who work in offices don't have a single friend in the job. All over the world, people are feeling increasingly lonely, disconnected and alienated, young and old male and female, married and single, rich and poor. We are in the midst of a global loneliness crisis, one that is inexorably linked to our political, social and economic choices and technology's ever greater intrusion into our lives. The pandemic has of course only made it worse. It's a crisis that's damaging our health, physical, as well as mental. For when lonely, our blood pressure rises, cortisol level rises, cholesterol level also rises steeply. The part of our brain responsible for fight or flight, the amygdala, goes into a state of high alert with the upshot that the lonely body becomes inflamed and overworked with very serious consequences. Loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 
15 cigarettes a day. Yet it's barely on any public health radar. But it's a crisis that also has serious political implications. For it was actually my work on the rise of right-wing populism that brought me initially to this subject matter. The conversations I had with people like Eric, a minimum wage earning Parisian baker, who feels very strongly that his government has abandoned him and dismisses and discounts his voice. And he, he explained to me how this feeling of being discounted and ignored has led him to become actively involved with Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National, France's right-wing populist anti-immigrant party, a party which in his mind listens to and protects the little people, of which he is proud to be one, a party which provides him with a place where he can belong. Loneliness is not only about lack of companionship, it's also about feeling unheard, unseen and uncared for, whether by the people around us or the social and political structures that we expect to rely on. Loneliness is personal and political. Yet despite the seriousness of the subject matter, I've tried to write the book with a light touch. So whilst the lonely century is extremely rigorously researched, there are around a thousand footnotes, well, I'm a professor, what do you expect? It's also rich in story and anecdote. Saito San, the Japanese pensioner who shoplifted in order to be incarcerated so that she wouldn't feel so alone. Kerry, the university professor, who's so worried at her students' inability to communicate in person, she's instigated a how to ask someone out in real life course. Hashim, the London Uber driver, who despite being with passengers all day long, feels desperately lonely because he's too scared to speak to them in case they rate him badly. These are just a few of those whose stories I tell. My book lays out the extent of today's loneliness crisis, explains how we got here and why unchecked it will get worse. But my intent isn't to fuel passivity or pessimism. My message is one of hope. Yet hope is not a lottery ticket that we can just sit on the sofa and clutch. Hope is a call for action for what we can do to turn the tides. As such, I don't pull my punches. Big tech, big government. As such, I don't pull my punches. Big tech, big business and government are all in the dock. And I lay out the reforms each of these needs to make or be forced to make. Reconnecting society must be put at the very heart of the political project. Capitalism must be recon Capitalism must be reconciled with compassion and care. But we also have a role to play ourselves, for society is not only done to us, we do society too. If we are to stem the loneliness crisis and rebuild community, we also will need to actively tend it. My book provides clear guidance on how we can do this. Because inadvertently or not, we have been part of the problem. The way we now live, the way we now love, the changing nature of work, the changing nature of our relationships, the way our cities are now built and our offices are now designed, the way we treat each other, our smartphone addiction are all contributory factors. So if we want to stop the destructive path of loneliness, there are steps we will have to take, as well as trade-offs we will have to make between self-interest and societal good, between anonymity and familiarity, between convenience and community, choices that are not binary, yet will demand of us the relinquishing of at least some of the freedoms that we were promised we could have at no cost. The recognition that each of us has a critical role to play in mitigating the loneliness crisis is central to my book. Reconnecting society cannot only be a top-down initiative. 
the future is ultimately in our hands. And Norina is with us live at the moment on Zoom. Welcome, Norina. So glad you could join us this evening. Thank you. And thank, thank you for, you for inviting me. Of course. And I don't feel lonely at all. I have Norina on this side and I have Norina on that side. It's two Norinas in there. <laughs> two Norinas. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, no, it's strange, obviously. You, you, you must miss the real audience. I do. I, and I miss being in one of my favorite cities in the world, Amsterdam, <laughs> where I've spent many, you know, many years actually on and off, um, you know, teaching at university mm. in, first of all, in um, um, Utrecht and then in Rotterdam and then in Amsterdam. So um, <laughs> the Netherlands is a country that is very dear to my heart. So I really yeah. miss being there in person, but I'm glad that I'm with you at least virtually today. Narina, tell us, how uncomfortable was it to meet a friend at $40 an hour? What did you do? So it was surprisingly and quite scarily comfortable. Um, Brittany, so this mm -hmm. young woman, college graduate, she suggested where we met up. I have to say I was a bit worried you know, before I'd done it, before I went and met her. You know, I wasn't sure was this shorthand for something rather untoward, but it it really wasn't. No. I met her in a cafe and then we walked around bookshops together. We went into a clothes shop store. We tried on sunglasses and hats. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was kind of like, obviously, it wasn't like being with an old friend, but it was like being with a new friend, someone who you were kind of finding it easy to talk to. We talked about some, um, actually, we talked about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. um, who was one of her heroines. So, you know, um, mm. obviously very much in the news, sadly, right now. And, um, and it was, um, it was, it was a, it was fun until we're in the shop. I booked her for three hours. We're in, you know, she laughed at my jokes. Of course she did. Also, I didn't hear you. She was being, she's being paid to laugh at your yeah. jokes. Obviously. And exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the end of, um, at the end of the three hours I'd booked her, we're standing in the store. We've just been trying on our hats. And she goes, time's up. That will be $120. <laughs> um, in cash. It, it, did she have a pin uh, machine with her or did she pay cash? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually had cash with me. But oh. um, but I guess nowadays she'd probably have a pin machine. Uh, one more question about this Brittany. Did she prepare herself? Did she Google you, for example? Did she know who you were, who you are? I actually used my middle name, so I didn't give my real name ah, okay, um, okay. because I, you know, I didn't really know what I was getting into. But what was interesting was, firstly, I said to her, who else, who, who are your typical clients? And she said, 30 to 40 year old professionals, mm. women as well as men, people who've moved to Manhattan, um, often far away from their homes from their families, from their kind of social support systems, working all hours, don't have time to make friends, and um, you know, want someone to hmm. go to the movies with, go to the theater with, have dinner with, chat to. And, and she, it's a strange story, but it does speak to a much broader story hmm. of how you know, almost around 50% hmm. of society feel lonely often or sometimes, and that was before the pandemic. And, and was, a, was one hug included? A hug? Yeah, one hug, a final <laughs> hug. Was it included? Um, or you it had didn't to pay extra? Feel... Oh, or you had to pay extra for the hug? A hug? Oh, yes. Did you get um, a hug? Was it included in the, in the, in the $40 so an hour? In, in that case, it wasn't included and um, it didn't feel appropriate. But in my um, research, I did actually also find out that people are paying to be hugged, hmm. to be cuddled. To be stroked. And yeah, yeah. You, you give examples of that, yes, yeah, in your book, yeah. Yes. Um, you, you, you describe loneliness, let's, let's, let's uh, I wanna, yeah. Can you hear me? You, you seem to have an issue with the... Uh... Yes, um, when I can, I can hear you now, but you keep cutting out. Okay. You describe loneliness as a global virus. Uh, what made you realize? What what started this thought you just mentioned in your in your in your in your speech? Uh, worries about right right wing populism rising. So, but where and how did the research for this book start? So it was three things that I was um, kind of observing really at once. One one was in my own interactions with students, 
um, what I was realizing was that they were so much lonelier than in the past. They were coming to my office in mm -hmm. office hours and they were confiding in me and they were saying, I feel so lonely and isolated, but also in the group assignments that I set them, I was seeing that it was much more challenging for them to interact in person, face to face. They weren't looking at each other in the eyes. Um, they were finding it just much harder mm -hmm. to interact in person. So that was one observation. Then in my research, I was researching the rise of right wing populism um, across the globe. And I was interviewing um, right wing populist voters, Trump supporters, um, mm -hmm. Le Pen supporters, League supporters in Italy. Um, and what was coming out of their stories time and time again was how lonely they felt. And we need to understand how I'm defining loneliness. So I'm defining loneliness, yes, in part as being a feeling of being bereft mm -hmm. of friends or company, for sure. And people like Eric, the Parisian baker, mm -hmm. who I mentioned in my film, um, you know, that was one of the things he talked about, how he didn't really know his neighbors anymore, how he would have felt very lonely if he hadn't found the community and companionship in Rassemblement National, mm -hmm. going out leafleting on Wednesday evenings, going out for drinks afterwards. But loneliness, as I define it, is not just about feeling bereft of friends and company. It's also about feeling a lack of support, mm -hmm. um, feeling uncared for, yes, by friends and those we're meant to be close to, but also by the government and by the state. Mm -hmm. And it was here where, again, this was a recurring theme from the right wing um, populist voters who I met with and also from the academic literature, a sense of abandonment, a mm -hmm. sense of having been forsaken mm -hmm. by governments mm -hmm. that was coming out time and time again. And of course, right wing populists have played very effectively at both these types of loneliness. You know, think about Trump's rallies, you know, all these people packed together, singing in unison, wearing the same branded um, MAGA hats mm -hmm. and red outfits, um, feeling a connected. sense of brother, yeah. brotherhood and community. Yeah, they feel connected. They feel connected with, with this. So but exactly. while you were working on it, uh, uh, Norina, while you were working on your book, this other virus, the, the real virus, the COVID-19 virus, visited us all, right? And we experienced to some extent, at least I did, and in, in, in the Netherlands we did, I mentioned the king already, but we also experienced a new strong feeling of togetherness. Eh? Focusing on family again, focusing on the really important things, which is not the economy, but our health. Eh? Making a clear distinction between the two and choosing for health instead of economy, which created a sense of community, created a sense of togetherness. Do you recognize this? Yes, I think here as well, that was the initial reaction. And I don't know if it was the same in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. but here every Thursday evening, we would actually stand on our doorsteps. So when we were in lockdown and we weren't allowed to go out, every Thursday evening, there would be something called the clap for carers. Mm -hmm. And we would all stand on our doorsteps yeah. and for one minute, clap and yeah. cheer and bang pots to cheer the nurses and the doctors and the National Health Service. And what was incredible was not only that we were cheering them and showing our respect for them, but there was also we would look, you could look down the street and you would see everyone there and you would see people in windows in their um, apartments opposite. And it was a sense of community and connection. And that was really, you know, that was, that was wonderful. The challenge is of course, holding on to that moving forward because, um, you know, here as well, health was initially put um, before the economy, but now the, um, now the discussion, you know, seems to have, the balance seems to be tipping to the economy mm -hmm. first. And um, and I think also it was easy to, um, and there were beautiful stories, beautiful stories mm -hmm. of people mm -hmm. coming together during the pandemic. In the book I write, for example, about um, there was one volunteer who went all around the city looking for milk, and this was in the mm -hmm. UK, milk mm -hmm. in glass bottles, because there was... Um, 
to help a blind man who had been isolated mm -hmm. and needed his milk to be in glass bottles so he could see the different types of containers mm -hmm. and discern the liquids. So, I mean, there were lovely stories like that. But even early on, there were also stories of kind of selfishness triumphing. Um, you know, people in supermarkets kind of taking away oh, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. toilet roll and um, and um, and all the food from others. Mm -hmm. and. Online, in, um, there was actually a significant rise in cyberbullying and online hatred during the coronavirus. And of course, populist politicians, right wing populist politicians using the coronavirus as a way to amplify and reinforce their anti other messages. Think about Trump's Chinese virus. So I think um, whilst there were these wonderful moments of solidarity and community, and that's what I think my hope is that we build upon. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't be so starry eyed that think that that was the only story because it wasn't. So we will need to actively force mm -hmm. ourselves, I think, to continue that momentum. And just one other point on this is that historically, and this is the good news, historically, after these moments, um, this is when societies have come together again. So in the United Kingdom, it was after World War II that the National Health Service was founded. In the United States, it was after the Great Depression, you know, a time of collective mm -hmm. pain yeah. that Roosevelt implemented the New Deal with worker rights reforms, with investment into public spaces. So again, we do have historical precedent that we can turn these difficult times into real opportunities for us all. So, Norina, there's, there might be an incredible upside on this terrible virus, COVID-19. There might be an upside. We'll have to see. Well, while reading your book, I have to be honest, and it's very well written. It's a, it's a good read, too. But I also felt depressed every now and then. Uh, uh, the way you describe, and you gave already some examples, the way we, you describe the way we isolate ourselves, uh, working our phones 1,200 hours per year, if you start that, 1,200 hours per year, four hours a day, liking, checking, comparing, uh, and feeling lonely, not seeing real people anymore. It felt like something we cannot control anymore. We are our phones. And I felt in your, the language you used that you were, to, to some extent, you are angry almost. You're angry with the, the frightful five, uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, in the first place. Um, uh, you, 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 you blame them for this, making people addicted to this. And, and you, you mentioned certain researchers, uh, one big research, uh, 3,000 participants, half normal use, half no use of Facebook, Insta, and Snapchat, and they reported more happiness, the latter ones, eh? not using for a couple of months, more happiness, more life satisfaction. So, something needs to be done, and, and you feel the urgency when you, when you read your book. What do you hope governments will start to do fighting these, these, these the, well, the frightful five? Well, I think we're all increasingly aware that um, social media companies are not doing nearly enough themselves when it comes to tackling um, online hate, cyberbullying. 60% of um, British adults have experienced cyberbullying. Children, of course, experiencing cyberbullying at a terrible mm -hmm. um, scale and um, are not doing anything to deal with the addictive nature of their smartphones, which, in fact, they're designed to be addictive so that we're constantly going on them. So we know, you know, we've been now in this world of social media for enough time now to know that they themselves have not done enough and seem really unwilling to do so. So I think it is time for governments to step in. And I think the parallel really is um, tobacco, you know, a similarly mm -hmm. addictive drug, um, which also has very deleterious consequences mm -hmm. on um, on our health. Yeah. Loneliness yeah. is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes Today, a day. We yeah. um, regulate tobacco. I think we should regulate social media but as how, well. how, Norina? Where I do you start? How? Where, where to start? Breaking so them I up, for example, they are too, because this is their business model. This is the way they make money and they have shareholders and they want to see profits every quarter increase. So for them, it will be impossible to do it themselves. If you ask them to regulate it, they won't. They can't. They can't. You just can't. They're in this system. So where do we start? Absolutely. So I think, so I think that's why governments do need to step in and they need to regulate. At minimum, I think there should be a duty of care is the legal expression, a duty of care 
that social media companies have um, on the on the users. So to make sure that their users aren't abused, mm -hmm. aren't don't experience hate, don't experience bullying. You know, this is the kind of standard thing we would expect with another business. So why not with them? I do think there's an argument even for um, putting packaging on our smartphones, like on a cigarette packet, you know, maybe a picture of a scrambled brain to remind us when we buy them that these are so bad for us. Um, so, after, so for example, when my children are using TikTok, it's a big discussion about TikTok right now, after 15 minutes, they will see something disturbing them or, or, or uh, making them fearing using TikTok too much. How do you, how could we do this? I could yeah, organize. So you could so you could have literally pop-ups coming up. Yeah. You could also have prompts on social media. You know, this would be a kind of easier and less harsh regulation, but just that you had that they put prompts on it. So before you posted something, before it went through, mm -hmm. do you really want to post this? Okay. Just having that moment Take a break. to kind of do that. Yeah. You could have algorithms rewarding kindness and de and de rewarding um, vicious hate bullying mm -hmm, mm -hmm. their algorithms already you know uh, reward um, other things mm -hmm. so you know why not make them pro-society rather than anti-society remember you know the maxims of these companies uh, don't do evil um, connect the world I mean if they really want to live by their maxims um, they need to behave differently and if they're not willing to behave differently we do need governments to step in and we, of course, ourselves, there are things we can do. I mean, it is hard because the addiction is so strong, but there are hacks like, you know, putting your social media hard to find on your phone, like in a folder far away. Um, yeah. Did you do that, Norina? Did your... you do it yourself? Did you do it yourself? I have. I have. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it works. Yeah, they're really, they're like hard to find now on my phone. I have so to how, scroll many, okay, many pages. Share this with us now. How much time does it take you to find Insta or Facebook on your phone? It takes you like half uh, an hour to find it or what? No, no, but it takes me, you know, instead of it being on my home page, yeah. I have to do kind of four scrolls of pages to find it and yeah. then open. So I make it, so I make it harder. But the other thing is, putting our phones aside, because this was research in my book that I write about. There was a study done with um, couples and they put a smartphone on the table yeah. in between them. Even when the smartphone was off. Yeah, it still has an impact. Yeah. yeah less connected and yeah. less empathetic yeah. to each other, they felt. Yeah, but maybe what I thought when reading this part, uh, I think government should hurry up and make sure that in, educa in education, primary school, secondary school, there's much more attention for the impact on your health, on your well being, on your happiness uh, uh, of using your uh, uh, online um, devices all the time. And there's, there's only, I have three children, and there's very little of that in our educational system unfortunately yes i think that's absolutely right and that's something which government really can do yeah very easily you tweet it loneliness is political as well as personal economic as well as social technology is a driver for sure but not the sole culprit so too are decades of policies undermining our communities and dismantling our civic institutions explain so We've talked about technology that clearly is a driver, but there are other factors as well. Um, mass migration mm -hmm. to cities, um, rising um, numbers of people who live on their own. Uh, these are all factors as well, but so too, I argue, is the, the past few decades ideology, mm -hmm. dominant ideology um, in most of the world, neoliberalism, a particularly harsh form of capitalism. A dog eat dog, greed is good, me first, yeah. selfish, self interested form of capitalism that really was always going to be at odds with people feeling connected to each other, close to each other, um, for society feeling cohesive, because it was all individual, I focused mm -hmm. rather than we focused. And it's important to remember that there are other models of capitalism. You know, I'm not by saying this, saying that I'm anti-capitalist. I'm saying we can embrace a different form of capitalism. You know, think back to Asian capitalism or um, 
more traditional mm -hmm. um, European style capitalism, Scandinavian capitalism. It always had a more collectivist um, mm -hmm. spirit. And yet, ever since Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, really, um, since the 1980s, we've seen this very harsh, brutal form of capitalism um, take hold, which also took hold fascinatingly in the way we as individuals see the world. And one example I give in my book to highlight that is how pop song lyrics mm. have changed since the 1980s or since the 1970s, really. So if you think about in the 1970s, songs like We Are The Champions um, by Queen, by today, um, we see a steady increase in song lyrics with the words I, I, I me think. in them, and my, mm -hmm. and a diminishment of lyrics, we, mm -hmm. us, our. Fascinating. But also what you describe, it also made sense. If I look at myself, I'm 57 years old, and I remember that after the wall came tumbling down in 89, I also mm -hmm. decided that's a good thing. Let's, 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 let, let's let markets give, let's make room for markets. Uh, less politicians, less left or right-wing politicians, the amoral market, uh, let's, let's m room for entrepreneurial behavior, for individualism, for um, success. Uh, so I, I remember that very vividly back in the 90s. I, I was very much convinced too that this was a big solution for all the political stuff and big governments, bureaucracies and all that. So it was, a, it was, a, it was not that, it was not, it did make sense to some extent. And, and it does. And in the book, I have a whole chapter, The Loneliness Economy, about the market's ability to innovate to help play a part in solving the loneliness crisis mm -hmm. from artificial intelligence, robots that care for people. I think, mm -hmm. I think they have a really important role to play. Um, but also things like in South Korea, there are discotheques where thousands of elderly South Koreans dance in the daytime. They pay to admit these are commercial ventures, but they go and dance in daytime to be together. And of course, you know, we saw before the pandemic stopped everything in its track, a real rise in mm -hmm. the loneliness economy in people paying for collective experiences. So I think the market really can deliver. And if we think about our own local neighborhoods, mm -hmm. our local shops have played an integral role and continue to play an integral role in anchoring and nurturing our communities. So I'm not anti-market, I'm not anti-innovation, but at the same time, I recognize that governments have a role to play here and i don't know how it was in the netherlands but in the united kingdom what we've seen since the financial crisis especially so since 2008 was a massive underinvestment in deinvestment mm -hmm. in the infrastructure of community in public libraries in youth clubs in old aged homes in centers day centers for people to congregate we need spaces public mm -hmm. spaces funded by the government for people to come together. And that's another thing that governments really need to do. And, and the time is now. I, um, last January in Davos, the Edelman Trust Barometer, they have this Trust Barometer presented every year. And it said that uh, close to 60% believes that the capitalist system as we know it right now, the neoliberalism uh, as we know it right now, does more harm than good. So uh, two th almost two thirds, and they have, they have these big, big researches. Um, so things will change now, I guess. And, and then, of course, we have to be very, very careful what way it will uh, develop. So what do you hope? What do you hope governments will do to restore the balance? Um, yeah, great question. So I think part of it is about funding the infrastructure of community. Mm -hmm. So making sure that public spaces have public funding so that people have places where they can congregate. I think the other thing is governments can play a role in helping our local communities thrive, in helping our local shops thrive. I would really advocate a new category of business um, to be helped in the tax code, pro-community businesses, things like local bookshops that have often played a very integral role in nurturing communities. They should be getting favorable tax breaks. Mm -hmm. More generally, our local shops should be getting favorable tax breaks right now so that they can deal with the double whammy of the rise of e-commerce and also the um, downturn due to the coronavirus. In Belgium, there's even an empty tax, an empty shop tax that has mm -hmm. been levied on um, shops so that if landlords, I don't know if it's the same in the Netherlands, but here we see a lot of shops which are just left empty 
for a very long time as landlords wait to get higher rents. But Belgium has imposed um, taxes on these shops mm -hmm. um, for the longer they're kept empty to incentivize the landlords. I think there's a lot government can do around regulating social media mm -hmm. companies, as we've already spoken about. Mm -hmm. I think it's also about valuing explicitly care, people who care. Um, you know, often people who care in society, teachers, nurses, essential workers, the people we've relied upon so much, are those who have, uh, who are paid the least. Mm. You know, governments have a role that they can play there too. And then we should also take a page out of the book of um, New Zealand's Prime Minister, mm. Jacinda Ardem, who we're all kind of looking up to for lots of reasons right now. Mm. But one of the things she did, um, in 2020, just before the um, coronavirus, she announced that they were not just in New Zealand in their budgeting process going to be using, um, looking at progress on traditional economic metrics like GDP. They were also going to be looking at metrics like um, how lonely society was, how much citizens trusted each other and use those progress on those metrics in order to determine their budget. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and one final thing, because I think this really speaks to this whole conference um, and the ideals of this conference. Now more than ever, governments can play a role in bringing different people together. Mm -hmm. People of different socioeconomic groups, different ethnicities, um, different genders, different ages. And President Macron actually trialed a scheme um, last year of um, civic engagement for 15 to 16 year olds, where a group of 15, 16 year olds spent a month together from a, a vast array of socioeconomic backgrounds, um, ethnicities, um, very diverse, and they did expeditions together, they worked together, they did voluntary work together, they worked out together how to allocate, they lived together, they worked out how to allocate chores, who would do the housework, who would do the cleaning. And through this process, um, different people learned not what made them different, but what they had in common. And they were able at a very micro level to practice inclusive democracy, mm -hmm. that give and take, that respect for others that unfortunately has been lost mm -hmm. um, across the globe in many years, over mm -hmm. the recent years. Mm -hmm. what, what maybe we should give a little bit focus on is uh, focus on is the um, uh, the financial markets and the way they work this is something i'm specialized in to some extent and what i find out i, I recently wrote a book about unilever trying to find out if there's room for a listed company like unilever both in the uk and in the netherlands if it's possible to do to do good do well by doing good and that's their claim yeah. uh, to be a force for good as they say but then you look at the financial markets in the financial markets Money is being steered by I here now. Short focus, me, and the I you just mentioned, here, mm -hmm. close by, and now. And what, what, what you're discussing, what you're proposing is we should focus on they, there, then. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Next generations, further from, your, from home, yeah. uh, in the yeah. future, long term. So in order to get there, and whether it's climate change or loneliness, we should learn markets to price, to price the real things. For example, in, if you talk about climate, governments should start tomorrow uh, putting a, a huge price tag on carbon dioxide. Just tomorrow, a big, uh, uh, and then in Europe, if possible, and if, uh, the best, of course, is the whole world. But so reading your book, I thought we should also, the cost of loneliness, the, the real cost, the moment you, you, you can really put a, a, a number on it, like the 15 cigarettes, or even better, in money, yes. then you can put it in your spreadsheets. And then it yes. starts to work in financial markets, and they will make the right decisions, more long-term focused on well-being. And in the end of the book, you mentioned even gross happiness, eh? the gross uh, national happiness instead of the gross national product. So, uh, but this is extremely difficult. These markets, they, 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 they like your book, and, they, and they'll maybe read it, but then they know, you know what, how can I put this in my spreadsheets? Well, um, at a very practical level, just thinking about the loneliness of employees. So just at your okay. most practical level as uh, a business, 
even before the coronavirus, sixty percent of office workers globally said that they were lonely at work. No, forty percent. No, no, wait, Norina, I have to correct you here. I just—it's forty percent globally because I prepared a question on this oh, one. Forty percent globally it, and sixty percent in, in the UK. UK. So what's wrong with you in the UK? Uh, <laughs> that I prepared this UK. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, clearly, it's even no, lonely here. It's, huge. But, it's um, huge. It's huge. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Yeah. Huge issue, and it's and it's one that has a financial cost because there's research in the book that shows very clearly that lonely employees are less productive. Mm -hmm. um, they feel less engaged with their company. They feel less loyal to their company, mm -hmm. so they leave more, and which is expensive. So there is a kind of clear business cost for actually making your employees feel less lonely, more connected to each mm -hmm. other. So at a micro level, you can build that business case. At a global level, um, at a national level, you can also build an economic case because we know by looking at, um, again, this is research in the book, we know um, that governments are spending many, many millions of euros every year mm -hmm. on dealing with the health impact of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And this has been costed um, mm -hmm. in various studies. So um, so I think there is a kind of, um, so I think there is a loneliness um, tax that perhaps could yeah. legitimately be levied. But I think, and I think, you know, if we think back a few years, and I'm sure you've thought about this in the context of Unilever. You know, if we think back to when the tobacco companies were mm -hmm. selling their tobacco, and they never thought that anyone would impose taxes on them or care what they were doing or they would be found out. Later, with food, I mean, something I was warning food companies for many years before we started seeing regulations coming in place about sugar in food and um, the, you know, governments intervening. So I would argue that change will come, regulatory change will come mm. around how businesses treat their employees okay. and about the cost that they're, that they're kind of imposing on society. And the smart companies will um, preempt the regulation mm -hmm. and get their ducks in place. Yeah. But there also, is, there also has been great leadership on this front. And, you know, as you saw in Unilever with um, Paul Polman, you know, there are leaders who can also say, you know, I'm not going to play by these rules. Mm -hmm. And and there are people who have done that. And he was quite he was quite successful. But my it's 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 not a very friendly question, but I'm just curious. Go on, so go do it. globally it's forty percent. Globally what was that, right? globally it's forty yeah. percent. And yeah. in the UK, it's 60%. So I was just, I had to ask this question, obviously. What's, what's happening in the UK? Because it's even worse. It's 50% it's worse compared to the rest of the world. How come yeah. you're mo even more lonely? Well, I think that's a great question. I have no like empirical <laughs> um, way of answering that. But one thing that I talk about in the book, and maybe it's less common um, maybe there, maybe the, maybe it's something that's very common in the UK. Maybe it's not as common in every country. Mm -hmm. Is the rise of the open plan office that we've seen oh, in yeah, recent years, it, yeah. <laughs> and that is a real driver mm -hmm. for, um, as I explain in my book, for worker loneliness in offices. Mm -hmm. Paradoxically, again, because you know you'd expect they're designed ostensibly to bring us together, but if you've ever worked in one. Most people are sitting there with their headphones on, mm. desperately trying to focus on their work, not engaging with others. And nobody wants to have a real conversation with somebody when everyone else can hear. You're mm -hmm. hardly going to be authentic and intimate. So um, maybe we have more open plan offices okay. per capita than elsewhere. And, then, and, and again here, COVID-19 is helping us because everybody has to work at home. Uh, and, yeah. and, and we double edge though, because that's edge, got a whole edge. host of loneliness problems. But we, we see our, the first researches in the Netherlands show that people actually enjoy working at home. They miss their colleagues, but uh, on average, they would like um, to spend three out of five days at home, two days at the office, three days at home. And working at home is also a vote of confidence. Yeah, because you're on your own and you're being responsible. There's nobody checking you. There's no boss running around trying to manipulate or doing whatever, checking whether you're doing your work well or not. So, uh, th so th well, that's that's not quite right because um, there's actually been a rise in monitoring, mm -hmm. um, monitoring our work um, 
kind of electronically through our keyboards. Okay. So, um, oh, really? so oh. actually a really significant rise okay. of that. Um, of that whole business, which is now a multi-billion dollar business with companies really kind of listening in on how people are working. But, but, I, but I hear you, some people, um, some people have found working from home a um, kind of a pleasurable experience, but it isn't the case across the board and it isn't the case also generationally. Mm. Um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a nice space, if you've got a nice office to work in, um, that's fine. If you're young, if you're maybe, sh you know, got a small space, um, your laptops in your bedroom, um, uh, that, and you're missing your pals at work, it can be a very lonely experience. And um, what we saw, what we've seen in America, and I've been tracking surveys is that at the beginning of lockdown, so the, initially, people, the surveys were saying that people were happy. And that's actually been steadily decreasing now over the past two months. Mm. So it's too early to know. Recently, a book uh, was produced by Harvard professor, Harvard philosophy professor Michael Sandel. Maybe you've seen it or heard about it. I read an interview in The Guardian this weekend. And uh, in this book, it's called The Tyranny of Merit. He blames the center-left elites abandoning old class loyalties, focusing too much on merit 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 meritocratic mantra, the meritocratic mantra. You just me you mentioned it in your book quite often as well. Uh, success is a choice. He calls it, again, this difficult word for me, meritocratic hubris. And he promotes a new respect and status for the non-credentialed. Uh, give them respect again, the, the, the normal yeah. people, because uh, I mean, as your Eric, the baker, the French baker you mentioned, yeah. Exactly, and that was something that really struck me, whether it was my interviews with Eric, the French baker, or the um, Trump voting railroaders in mm -hmm. the United States, people like Rusty, um, people who traditionally would have voted Democrat. Yeah. That's, I think, the interesting thing. Now voting in 2016 for Trump and still intending to vote for him now. Why? Because they felt that they had been abandoned, forsaken by traditional parties of the left, mm -hmm. um, who they felt ignored by and trump of course really playing to this as le pen does talking about you know you the forgotten people i do not forget you mm. the loss of social standing it also and, and you mentioned her a, a couple of times in your book uh, hannah arendt uh, from this uh, famous book uh, the, the origins of totalitarianism her definition of loneliness is those who have no place in society that's more uh, that's that's the same uh, um what should, what is needed here? Um, you know, I, I don't think we should go back to the old socialism, the, 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 the solution. We see in the States a, a trend now that especially young people, even Marxists suddenly, it was almost impossible to think of 10 years ago, but still, uh, but reinvent social democracy or how, if you have a fantasy about future politicians, what should they do to make to feel these people again connected, uh, being part of society. What should they do, politicians? We, we have elections coming up in March. Sure. Well, part of it is around um, the gaping um, inequality divide that mm -hmm. has only escalated in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's easy to feel relatively left behind and marginalized when your income is flat or has fallen over the past 20 years and others have clearly benefited. So there is clearly a redistributive element, yep. I think that is needed to the program to some degree. But more than that, it's about thinking about really hard about how to ensure that people have jobs with um, status and standing because a big part of the reason, um, I think for this um, sense of being abandoned that we see amongst many um, working class voters across the globe has been um, that they've either lost their jobs due to automation mm -hmm. or um, the jobs available to them are increasingly these gig economy type jobs which you know lack status lack rights often mm -hmm. and lack the solidarity um, of um, a workplace where with history where you were coming in so i think there's um, a lot of work that needs to be done on the gig economy and ensuring that those um, lower income workers have rights and have status that goes with it. 
I think there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen around automation because we're only at the beginning of that. That's the next um, wave of disruption happening. And we already saw very clearly in the United States that those states which automated had automated the fastest were the ones most likely to vote mm -hmm. for Trump. Mm -hmm. How uh, 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 I have to just uh, to talk a little bit more about your country, the country you live in, because we are all fascinated by what's going on right now. We're talking about leadership. Um, you mention leadership quite frequently in your book as well. We, uh, you need leaders, inspiring leaders, leaders which really concern themselves about the normal people, uh, try to reconnect again. Boris Johnson, is he doing a good job? Does he understand your message? Do you, do you expect him to understand your message? Boris Johnson is doing a terrible job as a okay. leader right now. I mean, on, on, on so many fronts. And he speaks to, I think that, you know, many of my fellow Brits will really identify with this sense of feeling very unsupported, mm -hmm. lonely in the sense of feeling very unsupported and uncared for by our government right now, a government that really has you know, it, you know, it is beating that same populist, um, right-wing populist drum. Um, and, and actually actively seeking out to make us, in some ways, a more lonely country moving forward. You know, because as we break our ties with fellow European countries, as we leave the um, yeah, EU, um, as we now potentially um, trash international law, even um, with our pr proposed rewriting of the withdrawal agreements on all these fronts, my fear is that Boris Johnson is setting us up to be not only lonelier as individuals, lonelier as a society, but also lonelier as a nation, too. So the, the, the lonely century only only begun in the UK. It's going to get much, much worse. Well, we will have elections ourselves and we will have choices that we yeah, can make there too. Not, and in the meantime, you know, we as citizens in the UK, and it's the same anywhere in the world, can exert pressure on our governments. Mm, you know, we mm. are not totally passive and we should remember that. But then a lot of damage has been done already. Uh, steering the UK in isolation to some extent. Sure. Yeah, so um, we all have, that's, that's also in your book, uh, frequently you, you get back to the, this point, um, we all have a big responsibility, personally as well. Uh, we can make it big, polit politicians have responsibility, businesses have, a we all have, a, but also personally restoring the balance between, as I make this interpretation, between freedom on one hand uh, and doing our thing and making room to do our thing, me, myself, and I, you mentioned it before, and then balancing it with feeling responsible for the people around us, for society, the common interest. Um, do you feel, I, I'm, I, I really want to be an optimist, so I described already how I, I made this, this movement as well myself, back in the 90s, moving towards liberalism, um, 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 small governments, big markets, and now, after 2008, I've learned and tried to do the other way around. We have to balance it again, um, find a new balance between freedom and responsibility. Are you an optimist that we will, well, let's, 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 let's focus on Europe in the first, that we will be able to find this, 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 this balance between freedom and responsibility in time? before things really start to go out of hand. Yeah, as a, as I mean, you know, Angela Merkel, another yeah. global leader who we're all looking up to at the moment, you know, I think she has um, actually done pretty well on that front, you know, really showing a responsibility, for example, on immigrants and refugees yeah. um, at the same time as, you know, actually having a very pro-market um, position. So I, think, so I think it is possible to, I don't think the two are, at odds, necessarily at odds with each other, um, but I think, but I think it's about recognizing that um, if we put convenience above community, if we put um, freedom, if we put individual individualism above the common good mm -hmm. and a collective spirit, um, we ultimately all will pay the price in the long and, term. But I, but the thing is, the big issue well, is... Uh, no, but I think, 
far away. For many people, they think, well, that's like the climate change. Oh, that's 2030, 2040. Uh, it's not on my plate right now. I will focus on myself here and now. Well, I would argue that that is a, another maybe positive thing from the coronavirus, because I think even people who felt most individualistic, yeah. selfish, yeah, yeah, yeah. go, 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 I think really in these last few months have recognized how important it's been to have a local shop where you mm. can go in and buy your goods. How you, how nice it's been if you've not felt well and somebody said, can I bring something over? I think whoever, many people who maybe had forgotten the importance of community and our local neighborhoods now realize it more. And we really have to really build upon that. I do believe change is possible, but it won't just happen. We individually and collectively need to really take up this charge. And the way you wrote about it and the way you talk about it, I can imagine you personally decided to change some things in your life personally as well. Um, and I want to quote from your book, if we want our local environment to feel alive and welcoming, we need to interact more with those around us physically, face to face, and then slow down, take that beat, that pause, smile, chat. Yes, and I've been as guilty as everyone else, you know, busy, 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 running around, global citizen, traveling. Um, you know, I have been as guilty as everyone else of not taking that pause, of walking down the street and not saying hello to the passerby, of not nodding, of not smiling, of not speak, of not chatting to the postman. I am really doing everything I can to change how I'm behaving because um, not only because I think it creates a happier, more connected world, but also because it, it makes you feel happier and more connected, mm. less mm. lonely. It, it helps, right? Yeah, the it really helps. Like even those micro exchanges, and there's research on it in the book, even those micro exchanges, you know, that hello to the, in the coffee mm. shop, the n n two minute chat to the greengrocer, even those micro exchanges make a significant difference to how connected we feel to each other. So nowadays, you know, do smile more, do say thank you more to others, um, do slow down, do put your phones down, do, do what you can to support your local community, buy in your local shops. You know, it's so convenient nowadays to buy online, but you know, really, Make mm -hmm. sure that you are supporting your local shops, your local cafes, if they're able to be open. And, um, and also reach out to someone in your network who you think might be lonely. I mean, just reaching out can make a huge difference to someone else. I want to thank you, Noreen Hertz, for reaching out to us this evening from London, from your home, spending time. Thank you for your wonderful book, intriguing and inspiring. Um, and I wish you... Uh, uh, good health and, and hope you will be able to write more of those important books for us. Thank you very much for joining us here. And um, please, uh, listeners, um, uh, look at uh, the YouTube channel of the Forum on European Culture for the final vaccine program starting any minute now, or to look back at all the theatre discussions and debates what happened this weekend here at the Bali. Thanks again, and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Norina. Thank you. Thank you.